we're going to start a series <coughs> studies of appearances of the Almighty. This will be topical in nature, which is not something I normally do, but hopefully beneficial because we live in a day when the Almighty is not so Almighty in the minds of most people. If he even exists, he is small and uh, weak and irrelevant and indifferent or as Woody Allen once said, the great God is the great underachiever. We know better, of course, but it's good for us to all be reminded and equipped to, to talk about how almighty the almighty uh, really is. I much prefer the, the dialogue between uh, Aslan and Lucy, which I've shared with you many times before. Little Lucy hadn't seen Aslan in quite some time, and finally upon seeing him again, she said, Aslan, you are bigger. And Aslan said, that is because you are older, little one. She said, not because you're bigger. He said, I am not. But every year you grow, you will find me bigger. And indeed, every year we grow, every week, every day we grow, every sermon we hear, we should find God bigger. And so my prayer will be as we look at some of these appearances of the Almighty that we'll see how, at least a glimpse of how Almighty He really is. Father God, uh, we bow before You. Who are we to call ourselves Your people, to to worship you, to sit at your table, to anticipate uh, paradise uh, in the days to come. You are the Almighty One, the Holy One, the Great One. Uh, you are high and you are great and you are inscrutable. And so we ask your Spirit to open our hearts and, and make us teachable and eager to learn and eager to grow and see your greatness and your glory. So to that end, we, we commit our time this morning and the coming weeks as well. Glorify yourself uh, as we study your word. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Genesis 3, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast in the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman <clears throat> said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves loincloths. And then they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? <laughs> the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock, and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I hope that enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his head. <coughs> to the woman he said, I'll surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In 
pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring before you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothing. <clears throat> but the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. How well I remember that terrible Tuesday morning, some years ago, in a Nashville Presbytery meeting. Uh, you will remember where you were as well. About 9.15 that morning, word came that a couple of airplanes had flown into the Twin Towers in New York City. Arch and I would agree that uh, at least one good thing happened that day, and that was the Predatory meeting adjourned quickly. <laughs> that was about all the good stuff that happened that day. <clears throat> in the aftermath of that uh, terrorist attack, we soon were told that, that was the day that changed human history. Alan Williams was in one of those Twin Towers, weren't you, Alan? And God spared his life that morning. That, however, was not the day that changed human history. The day that changed human history is what we just read of here in Genesis 3. The fall of man and the sin. The fundamental sin, first of all, was unbelief. Did God actually say? The word actually carries with it a, a, a note of skepticism. Skepticism that Adam and Eve both embraced. They didn't believe that God actually said that or that he actually meant what he said. They didn't believe God would punish them. They didn't believe God had their best interests at heart. They certainly didn't believe they would die. And so they believed themselves well qualified to make decisions for themselves, to judge for themselves what was good and right and best. They took the fruit, they disobeyed God, and they ate and thought it was perfectly harmless. More than that, they thought it was beneficial. Because they gained knowledge has promised. And uh, what's wrong with knowledge? What's wrong with being like God? Of course, the knowledge they gained was a knowledge of their own nakedness. And instead of doing that as a normal thing, as they apparently had previously, they suddenly were full of fear and shame. They didn't believe God. And ever since then, men and women and even young people have disbelieved God, denied Him the right to order their lives, been fully convinced in their hearts and minds that they knew or know exactly the best way to find happiness and contentment and peace and even a little taste of paradise in this fallen world. Men and women continue to disbelieve that God actually said and God actually meant what He said. They refuse to believe that God will judge them. They refuse to believe that there are consequences to their behavior, no matter the clear, stern warnings of Scripture. J.I. Packer <clears throat> said, It would seem that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil bore this name because the issue was whether Adam would let God tell him what was good and bad, or would seek to decide that for himself in disregard of what God had said. 
by eating from this tree, Adam would, in effect, be claiming that he could know and decide what was good and evil for him without any reference to God. The fundamental sin was unbelief. Secondly, notice the massive consequences. Verse 16, to the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Do not restrict the pain merely to the act of childbirth or the experience of childbirth. Much more is uh, entailed here. The pain, the sorrow, the frustration that only a mother knows bringing a, a child into this world, a child that's a sinner, a child that will also rebel against God, a child that will not always honor mother and father, and bringing a sinful child into a world full of other sinners is a real recipe for trouble and sorrow and frustration. Moreover, her frustration will extend into her relationship with her husband, with the man. Your desire shall be for your husband. What's in view here is your desire shall be to rule your husband. She will enter into a competition for control. But he shall rule over you. What about man? Verse 17, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you, and pain you shall eat of it. Pain is the word we hear a lot, right? Pain. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Verse 19, by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. A lot of pain, a lot of sweat. His frustration will extend to the realm of work and his effort to provide for himself and for his family. There will be pain and frustration. Frustration all around in every aspect of life. But the most massive consequence of all, verse 24, he drove out the man. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. The most massive consequence of paradise was lost. Because Adam and Eve wanted to live life on their terms. Live life apart from God, from his presence. And so God in his perfect justice, almighty God, in his bigness, said, okay, have it your way. Have life apart from me. And out of the garden they went, excommunicated from the direct presence of God. What is life like apart from the presence of God? Pick a word. Pain. Chaos. Chaos. Frustration. Fear. Maybe terror. Because terror didn't just start on 9-11, did it? Terror started in Genesis 4. It didn't take long. Cain terrorized his own family, his own brother. And ever since, there's been hatred and murder and strife and betrayal and pain. Cain murdered Abel. Was anyone surprised this week that Molly Tibbetts turned up dead? Anybody really surprised by that? It's come to be the norm, hasn't it? Somebody disappears. More than likely they're dead. Some of you have been passing around this book called uh, Murder in Music City. How many of you have been reading that book? <laughs> Here in our own backyard, our beloved Music City, back in the so-called pit old days of 1964, Corruption, immorality, crime, murder, family members turning against each other. We understand why G.K. Chesterton once said that 
the doctrine of original sin is the only doctrine to be validated by 3,500 years of human experience. <laughs> or as the Catechism says, what Adam and Eve did as our first parents. And we did it too. We were in them. In Adam's fall, we sinned all. What was the result? We brought the world into a state of sin and misery. And so ever since Genesis 3, it's been selfishness and stupidity and cruelty and alienation from God and alienation from our fellow man and fear and frustration and terror and sin and misery. Light blows of the hammer falling day after day after day. We're always trying to fix the problems, aren't we? Crime, war, poverty, discrimination. We're always trying to fix the problems. We're never able to fix the problems. There are more problems, it seems. Anybody ask the question, why are there always problems? The defense. Put a cow in a patch of clover, what does he do? He eats the clover. He's happy. Put a fish in water. What does he do? He swims. He doesn't complain that the water's too wet, does he? But put fallen human beings into this fallen world of sin and misery, and what do we do? We create problems. And even trying to fix the problems, we create more problems. We're always trying to reach and always trying to grab and always trying to fix. Because in one way or another, we're trying to get back into the garden. Amen. We're trying to get back to paradise. And we're convinced we, we know how. We're convinced there's a way. If we try hard enough, if we spend enough money, if we get educated enough, we'll get back in. But there's this little problem of the cherubim. They're in the way. And they've got these swords that are on fire. Always on fire. And they turn in every direction. We cannot get back in. Some years later, when the tabernacle was constructed, and sometime after that, when the temple was constructed, you remember what was woven into the fabric of the curtain? Separating the holy place from the holy of holies. Somebody said it. What was it? Cherubim. Because <coughs> we still couldn't get in. The cherubim ran away. God knew we'd try. He knew we would try. He knew we would build our little towers of battle and make our own pathetic little efforts to get back to paradise. But see how big he is? You want life apart from God? Fine. Out of the garden, we go. Now after Adam and Eve ate the uh, forbidden fruit, God asked four questions. Three to Adam, one to Eve. He began with Adam, and the order of inquiry indicates the degree of responsibility. Adam was more responsible than Eve because Adam was, listen to this man, Adam was given the commandment. Eve wasn't even around yet. Eve hadn't been created yet. And the commentators remind us that when Eve ate the forbidden fruit, where was Adam? He was right there. And what did he say? Nothing. What did he do? Nothing. He was there and he was silent. He was there and he was passive. He was there and he was weak. A weak man. God's questions were all rhetorical. He knew the answers. Where are you? Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of that tree I told you not to eat of? Adam's answers were very weak. What did he say? The woman started the blame game, the first blame game. 
The woman that you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree that I ate. Apparently Adam thought he was the least responsible of all the parties. It's that defective woman you gave me. What he's really saying is that God was defective. We have a defective God because a defective God picked out a defective woman and what choice did I have but to go ahead and eat? She already ate. Didn't seem to bother her. So what choice did Adam really have but just to go ahead and eat? He was there and he was silent and he was charged with ensuring that the commandment was kept. And they fail. But it's the fourth question. The fourth question to Eve that I think is the most painful and the most penetrating. What is this that you have done? How would you answer that question? What is this that you have done? Eve answered truthfully. She said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. But she didn't really answer the question. She answered a how question. It was, this was a what question. What is this that you have done? In fairness to Eve, I don't think she could answer that question. I don't think she had any idea what she and he had done. In fact, I, I somewhat wonder if, if God really intended for her to answer or not. I wonder if God was looking at this perfect paradise he had made and simply let his thoughts come to verbal expression by saying, what is this that you have done? There's no way he could have begun to comprehend the reign of terror that was suddenly unleashed. All the demons that were Unleashed the sin and misery that would follow like blows from a hammer every day right until the present time. Pretty depressing sermon, didn't it? Pity we should make a stay back in God. <laughs> but it gets better because while the fundamental sin was unbelief and the massive consequences are just overwhelming, there is this great Amazing promise. Verse 15. God speaking to the to the serpent, to Satan. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. The name Jesus isn't mentioned here. The word cross isn't mentioned here. Nothing is said of nails or scourging, but what's in view and what's, what's called here the first gospel, the first little teeny tiny hint in very veiled form, very vague terms. What's in view here is the work of Jesus Christ centuries later on the cross. Yes, his heel would be bruised. Sort of a benign metaphor for, for nails and an old rugged cross. But the devil's head would be bruised, or as some of your versions say, the devil's head would be crushed by the work of Christ. God already had a remedy. On the worst day of human history, the day that changed human history, God showed up. And man was judged, and there was perfect justice, but also this great promise, accompanied by a great sign, in verse 21, the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skins and clothed them, meaning that some animal had to die, some blood had to be shed for Adam and Eve to be clothed, foreshadowing Jesus, thy blood and righteousness, my beauty are my glorious dress. Foreshadowing that clean linen, pure and bright. That will be given to the bride of Christ to wear because of the blood of Christ. He's clothed us with garments of salvation and with the robe of righteousness. All in view, all the way back to the beginning, to Genesis 3. A great promise with a great sign and, I should add, great protection as well. Verse 24, he drove out the man and at the 
east of the Garden of Eden, he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. But Jim, I thought you just said that was punishment. I thought you just said that was justice. It was. But also mercy. See how big God is. See how almighty he is. Because the last thing, the worst thing an unregenerate sinner needs is immortality. And so he did us a favor to guard the way back to the tree of life. God, God had a plan. He knew he wanted to get back in there. But only he could open the door for us. And if you fast forward in your mind to that Good Friday when Jesus died on the old rugged cross, Darkness came over the land. And what happened in the temple to the curtain? It was torn, torn asunder. And I'm not a rich man, but I will bet everybody here one dollar <laughs> that that curtain was torn right between the two cherubim that were woven into the fabric of the curtain, symbolizing that the way was open. Rejoice to him, said, you banished ones rejoice because the way has been opened back to paradise, back to the tree of life. I have a colleague some years ago whose wife was in Africa with some other people and just traveling, traveling around and, and out in the wild, as it were, and all of a sudden she looked out her window and uh, she saw several giraffe, giraffes uh, <laughs> just walking leisurely across the plain. And you know what she did? She started to cry. <coughs> Why would she start to cry at seeing the giraffes? She'd never seen a giraffe in her life. In her mind, she just saw a little glimpse of paradise, of this beautiful world that God had made, that we ruined, basically. Also, the even creation groans, and even the giraffes groan in bondage, awaiting full redemption. But she saw a glimpse of the beautiful, all creation scenes, beautiful world that God had made. We still do see glimpses. It might be a giraffe, it might be a sunset, it might, might be snow covered mountain peaks, it might be holding a newborn baby, but they're all just glimpses aren't they? They're all just echoes from a distant past spent in the Garden of Eden. C.S. Lewis talks about these echoes, talks about our longing for paradise. He says, all the things that have ever deeply possessed your soul have been but hints of it. Tantalizing glimpses, promises never quite fulfilled. Echoes that died away just as they caught your ear. But if it should really become manifest, if there ever came an echo that did not die away, but swelled into the sound itself, you would know it. And beyond all possibility of doubt, you would say, here's the world I was made for. <laughs> Father, we thank you that we will get it back someday. The way back to the tree of life and the paradise. As banished ones, we rejoice for your boundless mercy, your, your full atonement that you've made for us. Uh, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that when you showed up on that dreadful day, paradise was lost. You came with both justice and mercy. And even improved upon Adam and Eve's feeble efforts to clothe themselves. Lord, improve upon our feeble efforts to serve you. We thank you for your unfailing love and for your mercy, which is from everlasting to everlasting, through Jesus Christ our Lord.